History of a Teacher by Famous Fault Chapter 11 Drago's Detention What had happened during Umbridge's inspection of History of Magic went through the castle faster than anyone would have held for possible. How Umbridge had attacked a teacher and how that teacher had challenged her to a game and left her cowering on the ground, everyone knew. How it all had happened was very vague since students added and removed things to make it sound more spectacular. Alternate versions of what happened reached Severus Snape throughout the remainder of the day. The first version he overheard was from a third-year Hufflepuff, who was telling two first-years that Umbridge had performed the killing curse on Professor Muto, but that he had grabbed a chessboard and had used it as a shield, after which he started to beat Umbridge with it. Snape, who had great fun at the metal image that conjured, decided not to comment and tried to find a more reliable version. After hearing a version which included snakes and spiders, and a different one which had involved with the class turning into fishes, he decided to simply ask a fifth year who had been present. He was roaming through the corridors in the hope to catch one, but they all seemed to be busy, either in the library or in the common rooms. Not one roamed the castle. It was as he left his office to get dinner that he encountered a trustworthy source. Draco Malfoy was heading towards Snape's office, just as the elder man was about to leave, with an expression of pure anger. Snape mentally rolled his eyes, but held up the door to the blonde in his house. What is it? Snape asked coldly. The bastard gave me detention! Draco raged. He has no right! How dare he! What were you talking about? Snape asked, unaffected by the younger's fury. That filthy muggle, that joke of a professor! He gave me detention! I'm supposed to meet him in his office right now! That piece of trash even attacked a full-blooded witch! He should burn for all eternity for such a sin! Draco simply went on. I suppose you were talking about Professor Muto. Snape stated and said, If you were supposed to meet him in his office right now, then why aren't you there? I will not be given detention by a muggle! Draco called out, disgusted, with clenched fists. He met my father last Monday. He defended a previous house elf! That's unacceptable! Shut up! Snape said shortly, and Draco had no other choice but to obey. As long as Professor Muto is a teacher at Hogwarts, he can give you detention, and at this moment, all we can do is accept that, Malfoy. Snape explained, seemingly cold, but actually quite intense. Snape waited a while and lied like he always did. It is revolting to have to watch students under such a bad influence as from that filthy muggle, as you called him. But there is nothing we can do about it yet. Soon he'll be gone. You'll have a different teacher next year, at latest. You're telling me just to go and do what he tells me. I'm far superior to him. It's like taking orders from a house elf. Besides, he's supposed to be a muggle. What he did to Professor Umbridge is impossible for a muggle. And he touched her wand. I'm sure she's cleaning her wand over and over again right now. Draco shuddered with revulsion and shook his head to get the thought out of his mind. I don't know what Professor Muto did to Professor Umbridge, since I haven't heard anyone tell me a sensible version of that story. After you've been to Professor Muto, you can come back here and tell me exactly what happened. Snape ordered and opened the door in a clear gesture for Draco to leave. Once the Dark Lord returns, he'll be dead. I hope he suffers. With those words, Draco stormed out of the office, disappointed. Snape closed the door and sighed. Draco's last words had bothered him more than he was willing to admit. The chance of Professor Muto dying in the nearby future was too great for Snape not to worry. It was a shame that even children like Draco himself could be so corrupted, so fast. But wasn't that what Professor Muto was here for? To prevent or even remove that kind of corruption? Snape shook his head. It wasn't possible. Yugi patiently waited in his office, chatting relaxed with Atem, who was telling Yugi about how his teachers had treated him, and Yugi hoped to get some ideas from it about what to do with Draco Malfoy. It soon turned out, though, that Atem's experiences were of little help. I wasn't such a bad kid. I was eager to learn, and since I rarely had other things to do, I studied a lot. I learned a lot very fast, and they had seldom reason to be angered with me. It was the fact that I refused to give up that made sure that I could do anything they tasked me with. I learned several languages. I learned how to read and write, and how the concept of Egyptian art works. I learned a lot about politics, and the importance of knowing your people. Previous pharaohs had left the country to suffer, because all they cared about was their own needs. I had history, too, naturally. 
I used to ride a horse in several ways, and you name it. I did nearly nothing but study, until father died. In my spare time, I was with Mana. If I ever got into trouble, it was mostly due to her. But Mahad kept a lot of bad from happening. What did they do when they were angry with you? Yugi wondered with a smile. He enjoyed hearing about Atem's past, but somehow it also made him sad. Atem had always felt as a person who belonged with Yugi and nowhere else, but now Atem had his memories back, it was more clear than ever that Atem had an entire life before Yugi, and that they were indeed two very different persons that by a twist of fate were brought together. Yugi always thought of himself as selfish when those thoughts occurred, but it remained a fact that he felt that way. They went to talk to Dad, and he usually took a chat with me. He knew very well that it was mostly Mana's doing, but he enjoyed our mischief, and he made clear that he wouldn't mind it as long as we kept it the way it was, which we did. Even after I became Pharaoh, Mana kept jumping out of vases, cursed the guard, and then forgot how to lift the curse. She studied a lot too, though, so we didn't play that often as we became older. Well, I've met Mana. I have a hard time imagining that you'd be friends with someone like her. Yugi said with a snicker. <laughs> Mana and I fulfilled each other. She stood for all the disobedience I lacked, and I stood for all the responsibility she lacked. We kept each other in balance, and it was fun. Though she was more often annoyed by me than the other way around. Mahad deemed both of us hopeless, though. Just as Atem finished, someone knocked on the door. Who is it? Yugi yelled towards the door, and as a faint Drago Malfoy came from the other side, Yugi walked towards it to open Drago Malfoy was glaring down on Yugi with a clear dislike in his gaze, but Yugi wasn't bothered by it. He just turned his back on Malfoy, not fearing him the least, and walked towards his desk. He sat down on his chair and started reading the essays the second years had given him that morning. They weren't outstanding, but decent. Malfoy looked forlorn where he was standing close by the door while Yugi ignored him. He rocked on his heels and fidgeted as he looked around at the bright interior. He couldn't help but notice how unpersonalized the office was. Nothing could ever trace back to who this foreign man was. He threw the door to his right a glance. He was sure it led to the professor's room, and he'd give a lot to see it. Despite the fact that he loathed the man, he was undeniably curious about him. Are you just going to stand there? Yugi asked after nearly half an hour after having finished half the pile of essays. What else am I supposed to do? Malfoy asked harshly. Yugi ignored the younger down and made a gesture towards the bookshelf. Take something to read and sit down. The armchair in the corner is quite comfortable. There is a book on the far left of the bookshelf on the second shelf that you want to read. I could recommend it. Drago was well aware that it was no recommendation, but a direct order and took the mentioned book. This one, he wondered to be safe. Let's see. Yugi ordered and looked up with a faint smile on his lips. Malfoy held up a copy of Anne Frank's diary and seemed displeased. Yeah, that's the one. Who is she? Draco asked, not the least interested. You'll see eventually, Yugi said, and took the next essay on the slavery in North America and the war it led to between North and South. He ignored Malfoy to the fullest once again, but every now and then he looked up to see the blonde curled up in the armchair, reading with a frown on his forehead. It took half an hour before Malfoy dared to complain, which was about 20 minutes longer than Yugi had expected. This is boring. What point is there in reading this? She sounds like a bitch. She was. One of her classmates once told that she wasn't that nice at all. But read on. We are in a hurry, Yugi said, his calm smile still in place. I wonder how long it takes before he goes insane by your annoying smile, the fact that you are completely ignoring him, or because nothing he does faces you, Adam said and shook his head. What are you playing at, Yugi? Malfoy sighed deeply but returned to the book without complaining further. Yugi finished the pile of essays and stood up in order to put the essays in his classroom, but he had forgotten about the bar. It said cheerfully, clearly having completely forgotten about last time it did so. Yugi couldn't find the least of sympathy with the piece of furniture that was simply doing as it had been ordered to and kicked it harshly. Aww, it whined. What was that good for? Malfoy looked up from the book, clearly more interested in what happened between Yugi and the door than in the book. You know that very well. I don't want to hear that name again. I can't stand it. If you're not going to open, then shut up. Of course it won't open. You aren't the only one in here, the door said, referring to Malfoy. And if you can't stand to hear it, then why did you make it the password? 
Because it's foolproof, Yugi said, drained from energy. He walked back to his chair and dropped the essays on the desk. Then he sat down and cursed lowly in Japanese. Draco went back to his book, just to be safe. He instinctively knew that he better didn't provoke the professor right now. Yugi was absolutely drained, too, to the door's repeatedly poorly chosen moments to ask for the password and considered changing it. It had been the same with Rebecca. Yugi had decided to talk to her in his room instead so they would be able to shut Hogwarts out of their system. But the door had asked for Sugoroku Muto, something that had horrified Rebecca more than Yugi had held for possible. He had feared that the girl would faint, which she hadn't, but it had been close. Rebecca had been very angry with him for what he had nearly done to Umbridge, and because he hadn't told her what was going on. Yugi had no choice but to explain his reasons to Rebecca. It would be no good if you learned everything from me. Nearly no one here has an idea about what's going on. If you knew everything at once, people would start asking questions which you shouldn't answer. It's better if you find out everything from sources the other students can comprehend. Rebecca didn't have a choice but to agree, and eventually they had wind up talking memories, a painful experience for Yugi, but he wouldn't deny that he was glad he had. It was as if he suddenly could remember his friends better. He had told Rebecca about Merrick, Ishizu, Rashid, and Noah, and Rebecca had even spoken to Adem. Adem and Rebecca discussed everything that had happened around the Orichalcos, a discussion Yugi found very interesting since he hadn't been around all the time. Atem told Rebecca what had happened on the train with Haga, and how it had crashed, and how they had met Ironheart, Chris, and Sunny, and how Kaiba got involved. Yugi found it fun to listen how Rebecca had helped Kaiba hack into his own company. A smile appeared on Yugi's face once again at the thought of how annoyed Kaiba must have been at needing to get help from a ten-year-old to hack into his own system. Though even Rebecca had to admit that the Von Schroeders were superior when it came to computers. Yugi caught himself wondering what Leon was up to nowadays. Was he still a duelist, or had he grown away from it? Yugi doubted it. Rebecca and Atem finished the conversation with Atem telling Rebecca about his life before he was locked away in the puzzle. After she heard what had happened, Rebecca was suddenly filled with a lot more respect for the ancient spirit. She had always been worried about the spirit's darkness, but now that was explained and long vanquished, it was okay. Now she could relax and get to know him. Atem had ended the conversation with a cheerful, I'm glad there's 5,000 years between you and Mana. You two wouldn't have been able to stand each other. Yugi's got the class in five minutes, so I believe it's time for you to make your departure. Rebecca, who had been lying stretched out on the bed, staring at the draperies while Atem was sitting on the windowsill, jumped up at those words, had sprinted out the room with a quick, See ya! and left faster than Atem had held for possible. What are you smiling at? A sharp voice asked, annoyed. What? Yugi wondered, confused, and was abruptly drawn away from the near memory. Oh, uh, nothing special. Hackers are two very different people. He smiled at Draco and turned to stare at the window. He had a view over the Forbidden Forest, and to his great surprise, a skinny black horse-like creature with huge bat-like wings soared up from him between the trees and circled above them before diving down among them once again. Yuki couldn't say he had looked very friendly. He turned away from the window once again, and his mind went back to the werewolf Madame Hooch had told him about. Don't you have anything to do? Is it possible to read while there was someone in the room turning thumbs? Correct homework or something? I feel watched! Malfoy complained. In Yugi's eyes, that was a reasonable complaint, so he decided to answer. Actually, I have nothing to do at all here. If these doors would open, I would be able to get something to do, but they won't. He threw the doors a hateful glare, but smiled at Malfoy. If reading isn't an option, would you rather do something else? Malfoy ignored the question, but glared at the professor. Why are you being so sickening kind? Do you think you can win me over to your side with this calm kindness of yours? What side would that be, Mr. Malfoy? Which are the sides, and in which do I belong? Do you know these things? Yugi wondered, cornering Malfoy with his own words. When the blonde didn't answer, Yugi's smile disappeared. I'm not being kind, I'm just avoiding to get angry. Rebecca reminded me what kind of terrible things happen when I do get angry. It's a good thing she showed up and stopped me before Professor Umbridge learned it firsthand. You're lying, Atem stated, astonished. You're lying him straight in the face. I didn't even know you could do that. It's something I've learned the past four years. Yugi answered grimly. It works, though. Yugi was right. Draco Malfoy looked horrified. 
What did you do to her? Well, she tried to jinx me. I avoided and challenged her to a game. It's a very old game. You're punished when you break the rules. Do you know how many people break them? It's incredible, Yugi said, still with a calm smile on his face that widened slightly. How far have you come? Malfoy stood up and gave Yugi the book so he could see for himself. Yugi nodded, satisfied, and took the book. He put a piece of paper between it and told Malfoy to put it back on the same spot where he had taken it from. It's ten o'clock. You better be off now. I'll see you again tomorrow. I'll be sure to bring work so you can read in peace, Yugi said with a genuine smile on his face as Malfoy opened the door and left. What kind of detention was that? Tim wondered, incredulous. One that will pay off in the long run. Have you ever read Anne Frank? Yugi wondered, curiously. Tim shook his head where he was standing next to the bookshelf. Never. Well, you should. It's a classic. It can be boring at times, but... The feeling when she talks about her dreams and her future plans, while you know that they'll never come true, it makes you cry. Nearly everyone in the non-magical world knows that Anne Frank does not survive the war. And when you know that while reading, you can't do anything but cry, as she, with such hope and passions, describes how much she wants to be an author. Draco Malfoy does not know that she'll die. I want to see his reaction. It could just be sufficient to make him reevaluate, to make him learn from previous mistakes. I see. I don't know. It might just work, Adem said, still frowning. Or it might not work at all, Yugi said, not sounding very brought down by that possibility. I'm just trying to change things that are rooted deep within. The chance I'll fail is greater than the odds that I will succeed. Rebecca sat in the Ravenclaw common room that evening, her thoughts 5,000 years back in time. She was curled up in a blue armchair close to one of the elegantly arched windows in the circular common room under a bronze and blue blanket. She was phrasing that she didn't know why. Is a person allowed to interrupt this deep thinking? Peter wondered and waved a hand before Rebecca's face. Rebecca's gaze retrieved its focus and looked up startled. How long have you been here? It's late and the common room was deserted just a second ago. I've been here for nearly two hours. Didn't you notice me coming in? Me was thinking that you were just being an overall bitch. Peter smiled and shook his head. I was waiting for you to react to something, but since all you did was staring at the window, I came to check if you were still alive. I'm fine, Rebecca said and yawned. She threw the blanket off her and stood up. Thanks. So what were you thinking about? He wondered curiously. About a person who was unbelievably brave, Rebecca said and smiled, and she yawned once again. I believe you and I should talk more tomorrow, if you want. Peter snorted. Don't think I'm interested in having a friend. I just wanted to warn you earlier. Rebecca smiled widely. That's fine by me. I have been doing fine without friends a long time. I think I can manage without you, too. The condescending expression disappeared from Peter's face. It was clearly not the reply he had hoped for. Uh, okay, he said crestfallen, but he was too proud to take his words back. With hanging head, he walked towards the stairs that led to the boys' dormitories. Rebecca was still smiling as she gathered the stuff she had left in the common room. Then her gaze fell upon a picture that was sticking out between the pages of a book that laid forlorn upon one of the many bookshelves that covered the midnight blue carpet. She had to stand on her toes, but eventually she managed to reach them. Rebecca now was able to actually see what was on the picture. She closed her eyes and cried as she saw a picture of a little glass box that showed small figures from Monster World. There was no doubt about who represented who. Even the pharaoh was present. She recalled the white-haired boy to be Rio Bakura, one of the few who had survived the attack in the tomb. She guessed that the angry-looking one was the dark priest she had heard so much about. This was the book Yugi had given to her after the second class with him, which had been the previous Friday. She had looked all over the place for it the weekend after, but had been unable to locate it. She quickly put the picture between the pages when she heard footsteps coming down from the boys' dormitories. She held the book tight as she ran up the stairs towards her own room. She didn't dare looking behind to see who it was. Rebecca dived in bed and could only pray that no one of the other girls in her year was awake, but she wasn't that lucky. Luna Lovegood was sitting in the arched window looking at the stars, but she looked up at Rebecca when she entered the room. Rebecca had expected hard to avoid questions, but all Luna did was look at her and smile. Go to sleep, Luna said. It's easier to sleep when you've just cried. Nothing will have changed tomorrow. But for some reason, everyone is supposed to feel better the day after. Luna stood up, sat down on her bed, and drew the curtains shut without saying another word. 
Thank you, Rebecca whispered genuinely, but doubted that Luna had heard her. After that, Rebecca kept staring at the picture under the blankets. She had finally managed to achieve the wand lighting charm correctly. He said he couldn't use it, Hermione said angered. He said that they only obey the pharaoh and no one else. Who cares, Hermione? Ron wondered. Whatever happened, it was to put Umbridge in place. It's not like he harmed any of the good ones. Hermione stared at him with such a frightening expression that Ron took several steps back. The fact remains that he lied. And look what he did to Umbridge. Look at what Umbridge tried to do to him, Harry defended the professor. Every other teacher would have reacted too. You don't get it, do you? Hermione asked. This isn't about what he did or what someone did to him. What matters is that he does control these shadows and he lied to us about it. Well, I'd lie too if I controlled such awesome powers. They'd be my secret, Ron said. Those powers aren't awesome. People were killed and robbed of their souls to create it. It's dark magic, Ron. One that exceeds any other. What he just did was the most powerful piece of magic skill that I have ever seen. Professor Muto would be able to kill each and every one of us in the school in a couple of minutes' time. We don't know how these powers work, but did you see Rebecca's expression? She was scared. Hermione raged. Scared? For Umbridge's sake, even. Do you think Professor Muto is mightier than Voldemort? Harry wondered silently, stopping Hermione's furious speech. Ron and Hermione stared at him for a while. Then Ron turned towards Hermione, who nodded. I believe so, though you are the only one who can truly know. You fought him. You know how powerful he is. I've never fought Professor Muto, Harry said casually, so I don't know his strength. He thought about Umbridge's expression when she saw her wand in Professor Muto's hands, and he shuddered. He didn't want to get on the wrong side of him. The prophecy didn't say anything about power, Ron remarked dryly. I don't think Professor Muto will be part in this war. That prophecy makes no sense, Hermione hissed, suddenly all angry again. I'll believe it does, Ron said. I've thought about it. Do you know what Professor Muto seeks that destroys? I can name one thing. What? Harry and Hermione asked simultaneously, but with two very different tones. Harry eager, Hermione annoyed. Revenge. It did only make sense, Ron said, then turning his voice into a whisper while becoming all red. I want to avenge you if you were killed. Hermione turned red too, and there was an awkward silence that lasted a bit too long to be saved. Eventually, it was Hermione who broke it, whispering. The rest of the prophecy still makes no sense. Another pause followed, but it didn't last long as Ginny walked in, her face still covered in blood. Good lord, Ginny! What have you done? Ron called out. I've just returned from an air palm free. I broke my nose getting a door slammed in my face. She explained briefly. Now, if you would excuse me, I'm going to wash my face.